بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المذلمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم عدم الله أجورنا وأجوركم أيها المؤمنون بمصابنا بسيدنا ومولانا جعفر بن محمد الصادق عليه السلام إن لله وإن إليه راجعون صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا جعفر بن محمد الصادق فاشهد أنك لقيت الله وأنت شهيد عذب الله قاتلك بأنواع الأذاب وجدد عليه العذاب يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فلنفوز فوزا عظيما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون الله سبحانه وتعالى he says in the holy Quran that I have only created jinn and mankind uh, that they may serve me so we have rights in Islam which we have two types we have Allah, rights of Allah and we have haqq nas rights of people some things we have is haqq Allah between us and Allah we have salat we have fasting we have hajj we have zakat we have khums these things these things are between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> Allah created us to worship him but when we hear this phrase worship him the first thing that comes to our mind automatically is salat when we hear worship but this term ibadah is much more than salat actually it it surrounds many different things when we read quran it's ibadah when we are nice to our parents it's ibadah when we are nice to our neighbors it's ibadah when we help our neighbors ibadah worship when we give charity ibadah when we smile to someone that we meet in a nice way ibadah all of these are termed as worship so allah is merciful because he gave us so many opportunities to get good deeds and count as worship all these things that we do that are good they are termed as ibadah as worship of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we look at the term servant of allah abdullah it's the highest title that a person can have once the angel came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi and he gave him two options he said you can become a king and a messenger or you can become a servant and a messenger most people they will pick king because king they look as much higher than a servant but he chose being a servant and the servant of allah is higher than the position of a king don't we say in tashahud in our salat wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh and we see that we say that uh, we bear witness that muhammad is his servant and his messenger we bring servant first servant is the highest position a lot of time uh, they people they ask me it revolves around this topic of worship but they ask me i don't know if they ask you guys but they say what ayah in quran stands out the most to you they ask me this maybe because i'm convert to islam which ayah was the most 
you know, profound for me. And there's this one ayah that always stuck with me. Uh, it's in Surah Yunus. It says, It is he <clears throat> who enables you to travel on land and sea until when you are in the ships, and they sail with them with a good wind, and they are happy in it. And then a storm comes, and wind and waves come on them from every side, and they think that they are surrounded. So they ask Allah, sincere to him in religion. They say, Allah, if you save us from this, we will surely be the thankful ones. But when Allah saves them, at once they commit injustice on the earth without any right. So they go back to the land, Allah saved them, and they go do all to sort of things that Allah told them not to do. He's, Allah says, O oh mankind, your injustice is only against yourself, being merely the enjoyment of worldly life. Then to us is your return, and we will inform you of what you used to do. Example of those people, you know, they go through problems in life. Everyone has some problem, and they call out on Allah. But when Allah solves that problem for them, do they remember Allah? Or do they, Allah save them from sickness? Allah save them from accident? Allah save them from financial problem? Allah save them from the test they were taking in the school, allowed them to pass? Whatever they called Allah name and asked him for help Allah saved them from that the question is what do we do with that do we uh, uphold our covenant to Allah remain faithful to what we said we promised we would do or when Allah solves it for us we go right back to the things when they are normal so this ayat always stuck with me that we we need to uphold that covenant with Allah and don't forget him when the when the hard time is over we have to remember Allah in good times and in bad times that's why we say Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Praise be to Allah in all the circumstances, all the situations, whether it is good, whether it is bad, whatever we are going through, we always have to say Alhamdulillah. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah, Ya ayyuhaladina amanusta'inu bi sabri wa salati in Allah ma'a sabreen. O you who believe, seek help. When we go through problems, Allah tells us what to do. He says, seek help with patience and with prayer. And Allah is with the patient ones. So whenever we have any sort of problem, we should always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think that, oh, I don't want to bother Allah with my problems. My problem is small. Allah doesn't need to hear about my problem. We should ask Allah for his help. And Allah tells us to do this, to seek help with patience and with prayer. If we look at the examples of imams, we have a lot of things that they left for us. We have uh, a lot of dua that they left so that we can, when we go through hardships or we go through difficulties or anything in our life, even when we leave the house or we get, uh, we go to go on a journey or we even go anywhere, even in the, in, into the bathroom or into the masjid or into, uh, out of the house, all these things, we have dua for them. There's recommended duas. They have in Mafatiho Janan, for example, Sahifa Sajidiya, all of these uh, du'as Imams gave us for every situation. We have them, but we, we have to take a look at them. Allah says in Quran, He says in Surah Ankabut, uh, recite what has been revealed to you of the book and establish prayer. Indeed, prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing, and the remembrance of Allah is greater, and Allah knows what you do. Uh, so we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in Quran to establish salat. We're all making salat, but we know that it is command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> and the thing here we see that Allah says that the remembrance of Allah is the greatest and that the Salat will prohibit us from doing bad things. One of the benefits of Salat that we find is that it shapes and it molds our character to remember Allah, to stay away from haram things. It allows us to be conscious through, uh, of Allah throughout the day. For example, we start in the morning, we remember Allah when we wake up. We get a little bit busy with work, we remember Allah again in Salat al-Dhuhr. We get busy again and we have Salat al-Asr. The, the evening time comes, we have Maghrib, Isha. So throughout the whole day, 
we are in the constant remembrance of Allah and it will keep us on track, inshallah. <clears throat> Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> it will remind us of the mercy that Allah has given us throughout the day. There's an interesting story. This lecture we have several stories. This first one is about this man. He was coming from Iran and he was on a caravan to go to Ziyarat in Iraq in the old days when they had the horses and the camels and they went in a caravan with people. So this man was on this journey to Iraq and these bandits came and highway robbers and they surrounded this uh, caravan and they robbed them. They took all of their things. And uh, the Sheikh was on the caravan. He's trying to go to Ziyarat Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And they stole all his stuff and they took everyone's stuff. And then the guy, <clears throat> before he leaves, you know, the head leader of that, uh, uh, those robbers, he went over there and Allahu Akbar and went and made Salat. And the Sheikh is like, how, what kind of Salat is that? You know, you, you just stole all my stuff. And then he went and made Salat. Like, what is that? So the guy said, you know, just leave me alone. This is all I have. I don't want to cut that last connection that I have. <clears throat> so he said, well, give me my stuff back. He said, no, he kept the stuff, but he still made Salat. So the Sheikh went to Iraq and then he went back to Iran. And then several years later, he came back to Iraq again for Ziyarat. And this man approached him, had religious clothes on. And uh, he said, do you remember me? He said, no, I don't know who you are. He said, remember that time you went on that caravan and we robbed that caravan and we, you, all your stuff was stolen? He said, that was me. I stole all your stuff and I apologize for it. I made, uh, I, you know, keeping that Salat led me to this place, to Karbala, and I reformed, I changed myself. I started establishing all, you know, uh, all the wajibat that I needed to do, all the things I stole, I gave them back to the people. I couldn't find you, so I gave all the stuff that I stole, I gave it in charity on your behalf. So we see that this salat, this is like a thread that eventually, uh, it, it connects us to Allah, but eventually it will lead us away from haram things. Because Allah says that salat will keep you away from indecent acts and uh, haram things, bad things. So the person who keeps their Salat, eventually it will take them away from those things, but they have to maintain the Salat. So this is the power of Salat. Some people, they let go of Salat when they do bad things and they say, you know, I shouldn't be praying because I'm doing Haram, but this Salat is the one thing, that, the thread that is keeping them connected. Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We also have a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that he compared Salat to a river. He says, if you go bathe in that river uh, five times a day, will you remain dirty? Will you have any dirt left on you? Obviously, if you compare it to now, we go take shower five times a day, we'll be the cleanest person in Antalya. You know, <laughs> no one's taking shower five times a day. It, the Prophet is saying that if you... Uh, your salat is like this, like you bathing in the river five times a day, you come out clean. So whatever dirt or filth of sins that we have done, the bad things that we have done, when we go make salat, it's like we get a fresh start to start over again from that point and continue on. Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمَنُونَ عَلَذِينَهُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Certainly the believers are successful. And then he mentions certain qualities of those who are successful those believers and one of those are those who are humble in their salat. So we can see that the path to success is to making our salat. We always have to make salat. Even if we are unable to make salat while standing, we have to make it while sitting. And we are unable to make, make it sitting, the person has to make it while lying down. Even if they, can, they are paralyzed, they still have to make salat even by the movements of their eyelids. Subhanallah. A lot of people say, you know, I'm tired, I can't make salat, I'm, you know, I don't want to, I'll make it later, I'm not going to do it, and they make a lot of excuses. But religiously, we have to uh, uphold this salat, we can't let it go. We see that Imam Ali, alayhi salam, in the Battle of Safin, 
and also Imam Hussein alayhi salam in the battle of Karbala, they established the Salat. Even though arrows were raining down on them, they still performed Salat. So it shows that the importance of Salat. And we have a lot of sayings from Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam about this. Uh, we'll mention uh, two of them. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said, if a person who was making Salat knew to what extent that he was surrounded by Allah's Rahmah, Allah's mercy, then he would never lift his head from sujood. If we knew that benefit that we were getting, we would, we would always want to be in sujood. Also, Imam Bakr alayhi salam, he says, the first thing a servant will be asked about on day of judgment will be his Salat. So we have to, when we go to Day of Judgment, Allah will ask us first thing, Salat. If it is accepted, then the other deeds are accepted as well. But on the other side, if it is rejected, then the other deeds. So our deeds are contingent or linked or connected to our Salat. And we have to make sure that we uphold these uh, five daily prayers that we have. We don't want to be like the ones in Quran. Allah says, uh, Woe to those people who are praying, those who are heedless or inattentive in their prayers. I mean, they don't pay attention in their salat. I mean, they are in their salat, but they are looking around, they are thinking about something else, or they are jumping up and down. They are not uh, focused in their salat. We need to focus and make sure that we are present. That meaning present with our mind, our heart, we are present in what we are doing. We are not there, but our mind is somewhere else. Our heart is somewhere else. And then by the time we realize we have finished the Salah, we don't even know where it went to. <clears throat> it's interesting, Allah gave us a scenario in the hereafter about the people who went to hellfire. And he asked, it shows a conversation. How did you get there? Allah says in Quran, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ قَالُوا لَمْ مِنَ الْمُوصَالِينَ He said, what led you to the hellfire? And those people in hellfire, they will answer, they said, we were not of those people who prayed. We didn't pray in this world. This is what got us to this bad position. So Allah is showing us something that will allow us to see the end of those people so that we know uh, the ending of those people was hellfire, it was because they didn't pray. So that way we know if we don't want to be in that same spot, in that same position, then we also need to uphold our prayers. The uh, Prophet ﷺ, he said, the one who takes the salat or the prayer lightly is not from me. That would be the worst thing that we would see if we are on day of uh, judgment and we see that Rasulullah says, this person, he's not from me. Imagine the Prophet abandoned us on Day of Judgment and say, he's not one of mine. I don't claim that one. He's not from me. And it's because uh, we didn't uphold our Salat or we took it lightly. So we have to remember these type of things throughout our day when we have to make our Salat, inshallah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, <clears throat> one of the Mujtahideen and Najaf gave me some good advice. I want to share it here, inshallah, we can benefit from it. He said that we should strive to become people of God, righteous people, pious people, good people, God-fearing people. People of God, he said, they can do miraculous things. They can, people who reach this level, they are pious they are close to Allah, Allah will give them abilities, they can even do miracles. And this is not the aim of getting closer to Allah, but something that could come along with this, he said. He gave example, he said, look at the companions of uh, Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus, salam, the disciples, how they did many miraculous things. He said, if their faith, it got, you know, they were able to even walk on water, and things like this. But he said even if their faith got stronger, maybe they would even be able to fly because of their uh, taqwa, their faith in Allah. We see the, for example, the uh, companion, the successor of Suleiman, 
he was able to bring the throne with the before the blink of an eye because he was close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And righteous individuals like Salman, Abu Dhar, these type of people, they are people of God. These people, they have the ability when they get close to Allah, that they have the ability to even see the inner workings of people. They can tell if this person is a good person or a bad person. They can see people for their true nature where they are. All of us have animalistic nature that we have to overcome within ourselves. Some people in hereafter for certain sins, maybe they come as wolves or as pigs or as monkeys or as different things because of the sins they did in this life. And they will be manifested in the hereafter and they will come in that form. But the Imams were able to see and the prophets were able to see people exactly how they were from that nature. So they would see the what the people really were. <clears throat> they knew these things, but they didn't reveal them to other people. Uh, for example, one time a person came to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad talking about Imam Sadiq alayhi salam because we come to remember the uh, martyrdom of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam tonight. So some person came to Imam Sadiq while they were performing Hajj and told the Imam they were surprised. They said, look at all these people in the Hajj. MashaAllah, look at all those people here. And the Imam, he told them, there is a lot of noise, but there is only the actual amount of people truly performing the Hajj is only a few of those people is the Imam was able to see them for what they really were. And we should make a note that, you know, uh, he says we don't strive to become righteous people or God-fearing people so that we can get these type of abilities that the companions of the Imams have, but do it with sincerity to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of those ways is to <clears throat> uh, cleanse our hearts and uh, take the worldly things that we desire, don't put them in front of Allah. Take them out of our hearts. And we should use the dua that say, Oh Allah, take the love of the world out of my heart. Remove it from me. Cleanse my heart from these things. So we have to purify our heart and our mind and not let it wander here and there. It takes a lot of discipline. We have to focus very hard because our mind and our heart are fluttering like a bird. It's always going this place and that place and it doesn't sit well. We need to train ourselves how to focus and not drift right and left. We have to work on this matter by focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our salat. There's actually a shaitan. We have main shaitan, but we have shayateen. Shayateen are those other devils or jinn that work under shaitan. Shaitan is not alone. He has a big army of uh, people that work under him. Men and jinn, they all have different jobs. One of these shayateen, their name is uh, Khanzab. Khanzab, his specific duty is to distract you in Salat, to come and make you think of something else. You do takbir to ihram, Allahu Akbar, and then the next thing you are thinking about the school, you're thinking about the friends, what did that person tell me, who won the soccer game, who uh, you know did this, who did that, my bills are due, my mortgage is due, my rent is due, my wife told me to do something but I forgot what it was. All, everyone has their own uh, things they're thinking about and as soon as they say Allahu Akbar, this is when that shaitan comes and makes you think of all the other things. And then, next thing you know, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and you don't know anything of what happened to the Salah. It happens to everyone. But through focus, we can uh, eliminate this. He gave me an interesting story. He said there was once this person, a righteous person, and he used to lead the Salah in ba the Bazaar in Tehran. And a lot of people used to pray behind this guy. And he was very famous, come lead Salat. Everyone liked to pray behind him. And on this day, he started his Salat sincerely, with sincerity, ikhlas. So when he reached the line in the Fatiha, Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim, O oh Allah, guide me to the straight way, he started thinking of himself that I need a donkey. Because this trip to the Masjid is taking a long time. 
and I'm tired and I'm walking all this way and I'm old. Maybe I should get a donkey and can take me, you know, to this place. The journey is getting too difficult. And then after he realized he was in Ruku. Subhana Rabbi al Adima wa bihamdi. He didn't know how he got there. Now he's in Ruku. So there was a man that was praying behind this person. And uh, he was poor. He had old clothes. He looked uh, like someone low status, as someone would say. And now no one knew who he was. And um, he happened to be one of those people, those men of God, those people close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the prayer leader got to Ehdina Surat al-Mustaqim and his mind went somewhere else thinking about the donkey, this person separated himself from Salat. Now imagine everyone is praying together. This guy gets, the Imam says, Ehdina Surat al-Mustaqim. The guy, he goes and stands on the side, finishes his Salat, then he sits down and he pulls out this old piece of onion and some bread and he starts eating. So the people finish the Salat and they're, you know, upset. How come you left the Jama'at prayer? You left congregational Salat? How come? It's kind of rude if someone is leading Salat and then you just separate and then finish your Salat. It could look kind of rude. So they're like, why do you do that? And he said, I don't want to, you know, tell anyone this, you know, uh, I don't want to tell them. So they kept insisting and insisting. So uh, he didn't want to say it publicly, but they pretty much forced his hand to say it. So he said to the prayer leader that once you reached Ehdina Surat al-Mustaqim, your mind began to wonder, and you started thinking about having a donkey, buying a donkey from the market. He said, I came to pray behind a righteous man, not someone whose mind is occupied with other things from this world. So this man was actually sent to warn this prayer leader from letting other things get in between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beginning in between him and becoming a righteous person, of a righteous man of God. So this prayer leader, he put his hands in his face, uh, his face in his hands and he started crying. And he realized what he had done, that he had let something get between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then when he lifted his uh, face again to look, that person was gone. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> Imam Mahdi ajallah ta'ala farajahu sharif is waiting for 313 men of God, true servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to ask ourselves, what if that number had reached 312? Imam is waiting for 313. What if the number is 312? Why can't we be the one who completes that 313? What if we are the one that's holding this process up and we could end the ghayba by being the one who is the 313th? We don't know the number that it has reached now, but we could be the one holding it up. So we have to work on ourselves. We have to purify our heart, not let our mind wander right and left. And we have to work on this by focusing in our Salat. Imam Sadiq salam, he is famous for saying that the intercession of Ahlul Bayt salam, will never reach the one who takes Salat lightly. We all want intercession of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, intercession is when we are, we need the help of someone else. For example, we have too many sins and we ask this person to ask on our behalf. Ask Allah to forgive me on my behalf because Allah loves you and we want Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam to do that for us, to say that these are our Shia. They suffered for our sake. Please, uh, pray, please allow them to go to Jannah and please forgive them. We want intercession of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. But the Imam says, the one who takes Salat lightly will not get our intercession. They will not come to our aid. They will not come to our help. So we, if we want their intercession, one of the keys is to uphold our Salat. And the Imam focused on this a lot. As I said, to see how important Salat is, we can just look at Karbala. Uh, when the time for Salat came in, 
the imam went and prayed he didn't say no it's war time i'm not going to pray they went and prayed and other companions they stood in the way of the imam and instead of jumping away from the arrows they jumped towards the arrows to catch the arrows with their bodies so that they could uphold salat and guard uh, the imam while he was making salat imam zain al-abidin alayhi salam he even prayed while he was in shackles and chains. He had a big collar on his neck that they put, and it was hot from the sun, and it would burn his neck. He even prayed in this situation. But a lot of times we will say, Oh, Salah, I'm tired, it's difficult, I'm not going to pray, I want to sleep in. But the Imams even upheld Salah in these situations, even when they had to march through the desert. And the Imam was sick, he was ill. He was very ill, and he still performed the salat in this time. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he was kind and generous to everyone. He spent his life devoted to teaching the community of his grandfather the sciences of Islam. He guided so many people and he was loved by everyone. Yet there, there were some people who saw the Imam as a threat to their power. Imam Sadiq salam, was a disturbing thought in the, in the mind of the tyrant uh, Mansur. Once he lost his tolerance and he narrated the following story to his friend, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Muhammad said, I once, once I went to visit Al-Mansur, I saw him sad. Therefore, I told him, why are you so preoccupied? Why are you thinking? What are you thinking about? He said, Ya Muhammad, the offspring of Fatima, who are near 100, they were killed, but their master and their imam is left. He said, who is he? He said, he is Ja'far ibn Muhammad, a Sadiq. Muhammad tried to keep him away from doing what he intended. He wanted to kill the imam. He wasn't happy with only killing 100 of the descendants of uh, Fatima Tazahra alayhi salam, but he wanted to kill the Imam. Muhammad told him, he's a man whose prayer has left him no power left. He is busy with Allah. He's far away from seeking the kingdom and uh, power and these things. Al-Mansur, he wasn't content with this statement. So he appointed many spies to go look at the house of the Imam. They would record whatever happened at the house of the Imam, who came in, who left, all of these things, and they would send it to Al-Mansur. All the plans of the Imam to get rid of the hatred out of the heart of Mansur, they did not work. Al-Mansur, he wanted to kill Imam Sadiq. So Mansur, he put a fatal poison in some grapes. When the Imam, he ate those grapes, he had a sharp pains in his stomach, a feeling that his organs were being cut from the inside. There he believed it was his last moment of life was coming through, and at that it was getting closer. His wife Hamida said that the Imam was on his deathbed. He would fade in and out of consciousness due to the effects of the poison. He asked his wife Hamida to gather some of his family, some of his children, the neighbors, and some of their Shia. He was thinking about his Shia up until his last breath. So we, ha we also have to think about our Imam and keep him close to our hearts because the Imam is always thinking about us. When the Imam was close to his death, he made different advices. When they gathered, he said, Our mercy doesn't reach those who belittle prayer. Salat is the main principle in Islam. So he whoever sticks to it and does it is a believer. But those who take it lightly have left the boundaries of Islam. Our intercession will not reach those who take salat lightly because Allah says sahun. He went on reading some ayahs, some verses of Quran. Then he looked at his son for the last time. He looked at the face of Imam Qadim alayhi salam, Ya Musa ibn Ja'far, before his soul left his body while he was saying, Bismillahi wa billahi ala malat jaddi rasulullah. 
السلام عليك يا جعفر بن محمد لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Imam Kadam alayhi salam with a broken heart, he had lost his power because he had lost his father. He went on preparing the body of his father. He did the ghusl for his father while tears were flowing down his cheeks. He washed him and shrouded him. He put the kafin from two cloths that he used to perform the hajj with. In addition, he put the shirt and the amamo that were from his grandfather, Imam Zain al Abidin. Then he covered him with a cloth that he bought. After preparing the body, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he made Salatul Mayyat while hundreds of the believers were there. His body was carried with honor while the people were crying, Wa Wayla, Wa Imama, Wa Musibata. Wa Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Afterwards, his body was brought, brought to Al Baqi. He was buried there besides his great uncle, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, his great grandfather, Imam Zain al Abidin, and next to his father, Imam Muhammad al Bakr. Look at the grave of the Imam now. Look at in this day and age. The Imam is still madloom, the Imam is still oppressed. People cannot even go to ziyarat of Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad freely. Look at his grave, look at the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and then look at the grave of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, how it is in ruins, how it is demolished, our Imam is madloom. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'oon. اللهم كن لوليك الحجة بن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكناه أردك توعا وتمتعاه فيها طويلا برحماتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد